How's it going, everybody? It's International Master Danny Wrench back again today with a member analysis mini here in our Sweet Chess Games playlist. Now, the, the idea of the member analysis mini series here on YouTube is that we have a, a long standing video lecture series over on the main site where different international master and grandmasters review the games of our members, showing them what they've done wrong and right and essentially acting as their coach for one game. And some of those games that uh, get submitted for member analysis don't quite make the cut, so to speak, either because they're too short or because uh, there were some critical errors very early on and not enough instructive material to justify an entire 20, 30 minute video lecture. So it's not to put those people down and say, hey, you're not good enough for the main site, but that's essentially what I'm doing. I'm putting you down and saying your game is not good enough for the main site. Pick yourself up by the bootstraps and instead of sulking in the corner, buckle a lot buttercup and learn something from the video lecture here on YouTube. How about that? Today's uh, member that submitted the game is Dweezel1872 and uh, he was playing the white pieces. All the games by definition, despite my, my jokes of, of putting you down, and I was only kidding, and saying your game wasn't good enough, they all have some instructive moments, obviously, or we wouldn't have even chose them for here. And so the, the instructive moments in this particular game are, are those of technique. Uh, there's some really important lessons of development and I'm going to highlight those for you, and hopefully we can all learn from Dweezil 1872's mistakes. But also the lessons of technique in, in terms of making sure you win whenever you're winning and, and, and understanding that that's really the most important skill you have as a chess player. You can't always control if you sit down from somebody who's just better than you and just smashes your brains in, right? Or you can't always control if you're just having a bad day. Sometimes you're going to make a blunder here and there, and, and sometimes they're, they're, you're going to lose games where you didn't really play that badly, and you but you never really had a chance to win. In these settings where you actually achieved a significant advantage, especially a significant material advantage, if you're unable to come home with the gold and or bring home the bacon, as they say, in that type of setting, then you've really let yourself down because technique and making sure you convert upon a winning advantage is the one thing that a chess player has to be able to do because chess is different than other sports, right? In, in soccer or in football, if you're a European viewer, if, if a team is down by a couple of goals, they don't also get penalized by having less men on the field and by having to shoot into a smaller net. Uh, in basketball, the team that's down by 20 points doesn't get penalized by having four men and having to shoot on a 12-foot hoop. So, so technically, you're always on equal footing if you start to turn things around. In chess, if you're down, you should be down. And in, in a lot of ways, I'm talking about positions where you're just clearly lost, not a position where maybe you're down in material, but you have some sort of compensation. That's obviously still sort of unclear. And, and by the way, my, my critique of, of Black's inability to win this game doesn't necessarily take anything away from Drowsy1872. By the way, apparently his name is Drowsy, not Dweezil, so I apologize for mispronouncing that. It's always good to show great fighting spirit and to have the wits about you to not give up when you're down. And, you know, the old sports cliche, win one for the Gipper, never give up till it's over, right? Don't cry until the fat lady sings, etc., etc. I can try to think of more, I'm sure. I've already butchered a couple. The point is that Drowsy1872 sent me this game because he was proud of his comeback and his fighting on past the point where he had lost his queen very early in the game, and that's great. And I applaud him for that, and in my own games, I've had many games where I've come back from a lost position and had people come back from lost positions against me. So in a practical setting, of course, people do come back when they're down, and Rousey should be applauded for that, as well as many other people who fight hard and, and fight back from positions where they're lost. But it doesn't change what I'm saying, that you should always win when you're winning. The skill you want to have as a chess player, be proud of yourself for coming back, but then make sure you don't do it or allow anybody else to come back against you, right? So I don't want anyone to get their feelings hurt or misinterpreted. You should always fight on. You don't just resign just because. I mean, you have to fight on even in worse positions. That's part of the fact that it's a game. It's not a science. But from a position of studying, a position of analyzing your own games, a position of being self-critical, if you really want to get better, then you have to be hard on yourself when you don't win games you were winning, and you have to be hard on yourself when you get yourself in lost positions, because the only thing you should be able to control, the, the analogies I gave of sports, chess is a game of science and math in those ways, and the only thing you have to make sure you should be able to control is your ability to win when you're winning. 
In general, you have to have the mindset that if you're winning, you have to win those games. It doesn't matter if your opponent gets up and Gary Kasparov sits down or Bobby Fischer sits down, right? You still have to win when you're winning. You have to know that if you execute the right ideas when you already have an advantage, it shouldn't matter if God or the best computer in the world is playing the other side, because short of trickery or tomfoolery or magic that an omnipotent character might be capable of, you just do the math. You should be able to win. It's sort of short, short of anything you know, uh, fantastical. So hopefully I've made my point in terms of why it's important to have the good blessings of technique, and I'm just going to get a couple of those across to you guys today. And uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. This game started with E4, E6, D4, D5, which is a French. And if you wanted to learn more about the French, you can check out our chess openings playlist. Here White plays the exchange French, not the most ambitious variation, the advanced and uh, the main lines occurring with knight to c3, or even the tarash with knight to d2 are, are a little more popular. But after e takes d5, e takes d5, knight of 3 we have an exchange French, which is a symmetrical structure offering, not necessarily uh, a boring position, but offering, uh, when you have a structure that's this symmetrical, it's uh, the smallest things, like who gets control over the e-file, and the smallest amount of time or tempi wasted or not wasted in the opening can, can be the, the things you count on to get a small advantage in the middle game because there's not really a major structural deficiency in, in either player's camp. So uh, anyway, here, but here White plays the first big mistake. This move queen e2 check is, is really a horrible move. And if you want to know why, it's, it's uh, the same lesson I, I taught over on our uh, Chess Kid website, chesskid.com, which is that whenever you put the queen in front of a minor piece, you're essentially creating an old lady that swallowed the fly situation, right? There was an old queen that blocked the bishop, who blocked the rook, that prevents the castles, which stops your development and leaves your king in the center and all those things adding on top of each other means that this type of developing move creating dysfunction you're sort of retarding your own development is really something that needs to be avoided at any level and here black doesn't bail white out by doing the same thing and allowing a trade but rather just develops a piece and as he should uh, leaves white in a horrible position White plays another developing move and then takes on f6 and quickly, after a series of horrible moves, being queen e2 and then the voluntary capture on f6, finds himself in a lost position. White is already in major trouble here and after the move c3, should have just lost the queen immediately. I'm not going to over-criticize it because after a wasted move c6, black did win the queen in a couple moves. Now I could sit here and say, obviously for the last several moves, rook e8 is obviously the best move, which wins the queen in the most concrete fashion and and ends the game. So that's what black should have done. But the person playing white was Juizel 1872 who went on to win this game. So the, the most important lessons I'm taking it, into this video lecture are actually not lessons necessarily for Juizel. I'm actually being very critical of what he did here with the move queen e2, blocking his development, the old lady that swallowed the fly, voluntarily going out of his way to give up the bishop for the knight and open the e file was was almost as bad and then here not sensing his opportunity to just castle long when his opponent didn't win the queen for the last several moves it is really just wretched on his part i mean you can't you can't play chess this way you can't block your own development and open the center early and give up a large amount of material like your queen and expect to live to tell the tale at least not against a strong player and in this case white played h3 and only now black went for this and so instead of just winning the queen for a rook ends up giving white both a rook and a bishop for the queen, but even regardless of all that, I'm still taking the approach that this is an easily winning position for black, and that with this much pieces on the board, the queen should be able to outplay the, the minor piece in the rook without too much trouble. But the most important principles of technique, the number one most important principle of technique is your opponent's threats are now more important than your own. Not because you need to play like a wimp once you're better. Not because you should just crawl into a little hole with your extra material and sit there and, and wait for the storm to pass. No, you have to play real chess and be concrete and still play the best moves. But when push comes to shove, if you're ever evaluating positions where you want to create a threat or do something in your own mind in terms of your plan or stop your opponent's threat, you should always put more weight on stopping your opponent's threat than executing your own plan. And that's the number one important principle of technique. Essentially, stop your opponent's threats and you will win the game because by definition, if we're talking about technique, then we're talking about a position that you're winning. So in middle games or unclear positions where neither side has achieved an advantage, that's part of chess. You have to take risks. You have to calculate accurately and, and, and hopefully get your plan executed before they complete theirs. That That's part of a, a really exciting and an equal dynamic game. But a position that you're winning in, there's no excuse to just neglect your opponent's obvious threats. And that's what Black does over the next few moves and deserves to lose the game because of it. After 
knight d7, bishop d3, there's only one possible way for white to ever to get enough counterplay to justify being down a queen here. And that's if he wins this h7 pawn and creates an attack. Multiple moves are winning here for black. h6 should be simple enough. A move like this to open the h file does absolutely nothing besides give up more material and black will win shortly. You can throw in a little check a if you want, just to make the king make an awkward decision and then deal with the threat. The simple g6 takes care of the business. Uh, you create a situation if you wanted to retreat the bishop, and you put a blunt, sort of. You, uh, you remind this bishop that he'll be biting on granite for the rest of the game. Um, or even the move knight f8, and as uh, the, I believe, Mikel Tal, or they, I believe I've quoted this great champion's quote, misquoted it before. But either way, somebody who was really good said with a knight on f8, there is no checkmate. And I've repeated it many times. It's a very common way to defend your own kingside position, whether you're up a queen or not. So black has absolutely no excuse when you're of this kind of material to do anything but just stop his opponent's threat. So if you're a beginner player out there and you want to know, like, why is it that I get at winning positions, but then I blow them? Well, usually it's because you don't make this shift in mindset. The shift in mindset that needs to happen is I am now better, clearly better, even winning, and let me go out of my way to be disciplined. I, I will still develop plans and try to play aggressive chess, but as soon as my opponent makes a move, why did they go there? Why did they go there? Why did they go there? What is their threat? What is their threat? What is their threat? How can I stop it? How can I stop it? How can I stop it? Because technically, if I stop their threats and just basically trade pieces for the rest of the game, I should be able to win. And the queen is such a dominant piece over a rook and a minor piece when there's so many things going on both sides of the board. The queen will have no trouble dominating and winning this game. It's just going to take a few moves of coordination or bring the queen out and just start creating some threats to open lines. There's a number of ways to do it. But missing your opponent's obvious threat is inexcusable when you're up this kind of material, and it's the reason black loses the game. After queen c7, bishop takes a7 check. For the record, even this position, I would still happily take black. Here I would play a move like g6, which opens up the bishop to defend the rook's threat. Uh, I'm not afraid of trades, of course, because I still believe in the queen's power over the rook and the knight, and black is still winning. But the fact that he already gave up the h7 pawn so obviously just suggests to me that he's not in the right mindset. So I can criticize the other moves, but already the overall mistake was not even every move from here on out. It was just the fact that black neglected his opponent's threats unnecessarily and carelessly, and that's the number one reason why beginner and amateur players get winning advantages. And then you see one side goes up a rook, the next side goes up a queen, then the other side's up two rooks, and all of a sudden you're up four bishops. Next thing you know, Bob's your uncle, and we're all having tea in the afternoon. Essentially, crazy town, exactly. So after king d1, c5, white goes out of his way to create this threat of rook check and rook over, and black just misses it. Still, even in this position, g6 is easily winning. Uh, maybe not easily, easily winning anymore. White's gotten some compensation for the queen, but I still would take the, the first lady's chances here, and especially with white's king not really being ideally placed either. Uh, but knight to b6 just misses this obvious threat of check and check. King d6 would have postponed the inevitable, but at this point, black is lost, and here white loses to checkmate. Unfortunately, the person who sent in this game probably thought he, he was going to get credit for a brilliant queen sacrifice, but the it doesn't count as a sacrifice unless it's forcing. You don't give up large amounts of material when your opponent has multiple ways to deal with the threats, and basically you're just completely lost and be able to justify that or pass it off as a sacrifice. Obviously, this is the cold, harsh reality of member analysis. I apologize if I've offended anybody in this video, though secretly, wink, wink, not really, and I will see you around on chess.com.